The last time we stopped at the section on the different schools of Tantra or Shakti Sadhana and just to briefly recap, the three schools are Kaula, Mishra and Samaya. Kaula is a school which is based more on rituals and external practices. Samaya is school based purely on internal direct experience and Mishra is a combination of both. It is the Samaya school which leads directly to Moksha and the body is considered to be a shrine in this school. So the deity is the self, the Atman. So all practices are internal like contemplation, meditation and acquiring a one-pointed mind to go within and have a direct experience of the self and be established in it. We also spoke briefly last time about Shaktipat, which is the which is grace which removes the last obstacle. And it is not something that is given en masse to everybody in a huge big crowd. It is given to that student who has practiced, purified, attained different higher levels of consciousness and has an obstacle which doesn't allow him to be established in that higher state of consciousness. And then Shaktipat is given either by a master or it is a form of grace. It is also called Sambhavi. Mudra, it's also called, sorry, Sambhavi Diksha, it's also known as Mahaveda, it's also called um, Kripa, different words for the same thing. Now we will continue from where we left off, it's just a, a page before we start the text itself. And this is a general description on Tantra. The technique of attaining the goal of Shakti Sadhana is called Tantra. This is a method of helping one to realize the Atman. Etymologically, the word is derived from the verb Tan, which means expansion or introduction. And the suffix Tra, which means protection or guide. Thus, Tantra is the path of sadhana which leads an aspirant to the highest state of protection, Again. which is the highest state of attainment. Tantric scriptures expound the multifarious meanings, meaning of all the tattvas, principles, from the absolute to the manifest world, including the science of mantra. So a very nice derivation, understanding what the word Tantra itself means. It is expansion. It is also protection, guidance, go guide. It is also explained somehow in certain scriptures very beautifully as Tantra is a kind of a, it's woven. It's like a, like a fabric that is woven together, like a weave, like weaving something. And in a sense, it's like the fabric of life and you learn how to put together or weave your fabric. Take life in your own hands, you become the architect of your own life. Expansion in the sense of consciousness, protection or guidance in the sense of feeling protected and guided at all points of time and a, f a feeling of a fabric of life, understanding what life is made of. These, the building blocks of life, when you understand these, you can create your own 
patterns, when you have building blocks. Similarly, when you understand how to weave, you can create the, your own fabric. So this is a bit about the general concept of what Tantra means. It explains also the, the tattvas, that is the metaphysics of Tantra, explains how this world came about. So we're talking about absolute consciousness, the three rajas, tamas and sattva that then keep moving into grosser and grosser forms of reality right down to the material world. And when you understand what the world is made up of, the fabric of life itself, you can create your own life. We will encounter that again in the text itself, especially somewhere midway, which I mentioned the last time, where a sage, he creates his own world. And so you learn how to become a wish-fulfilling tree, create your own world. Continuing the text, philosophy of Sankhya is related to Shakti Sadhana or Agama scriptures. It furnishes three types of evidence, direct experience, inference and the sayings of the adepts as does Shakti Sadhana. Sankhya also accepts the teachings of the Vedas. According to Sankhya, one can attain freedom from sorrow and pain by knowing Tattvajan, the knowledge of both the gross and the subtle forms of the universe. To briefly explain this, Sankhya is the philosophy from which the Yoga Sutras spring out and so if you may recall, for those of you who attended the sessions or listened to the lectures on the channel, we talked about the three types of evidence in the Yoga Sutras. Either you have a direct experience of the self, you infer it through contemplation, or you have the testimony of the sages. The testimony of the sages is taking is, is a belief. You believe it or you don't believe it. Inference is more superior because you may infer that when you were a child, your body was very different. You were a baby and you looked completely different from what you look now. When you were a child, you grew a little bit older and again, you look different. You were not the baby anymore, but a child. When you became a teenager, Suddenly, your body went through so many changes and your mind, your attitude, everything changed. The kind of toys you played with as a child, you wouldn't want to be caught dead with those toys as a teenager. Most embarrassing. So, your whole approach changed. But yet something was the same in you. Some part of you was still the same. So, as a child, I was rather cursed. Something was... Radhika in me, when I became a young woman, still there was something Radhika in me. And when I become old, very old, some years from now, also there will be something that I identify or relate to as Radhika. Something remains the same, even though the body changes all the time. Even the thoughts change, the mind changes, the attitudes change. Feelings change. Everything changes. Yet something remains the same. And that unchanging part, that is you. So you inferred that there is something which is the same. So that is a superior form than belief. And superior to this Contemplation is the direct experience of the self. So Sankhya explains this 
and also the Yoga Sutras go into the more practical aspect of it. And this is also related to Tantra. It's not very different. It's only the, the terms are different. The approach is slightly different. So each person chooses a path that attracts him or is suitable for him or her. To continue the text. The profound knowledge of life here and hereafter is attained through sadhana. An aspirant knows that there is nothing that actually goes to complete annihilation. No object is subject to destruction. That which we call death is a change of form and name of that which is considered to be dead. When the body drops, the individual soul is still carried by the vehicle manufactured by desires. As long as it drives that vehicle, it is called the individual soul. The moment it drops the vehicle, it becomes one with the absolute, in the same way that the river meets the ocean and becomes one with it. It's a wonderful paragraph because it actually summarizes all the teachings. It says, nothing is really destroyed or annihilated. And what you call death is actually just change of form. As long as you have a body, the individual soul is carried by this vehicle. This body is a vehicle. And it was manufactured by desires that are stored in your unconscious mind. And as soon as you drop the vehicle, you are and become one with the Absolute, you become Universal Consciousness, provided you are a free soul, of course. In the Tripura Rahasya, the dialogue between Sri Dattatraya and Sri Parshurama leads the aspirant to know what is duality and what is the Absolute, one without second, what is Dvaita and what is Advaita. The state of Advaita cannot be discussed, it can only be realized. Discussions are only possible in the state of duality. So this text is actually a form of dialogue. Like many great texts, this is also a dialogue, like the Bhagavad Gita, like the New Testament, which is also a dialogue between Jesus and the Apostles or others. So many great texts, uh, the Upanishads from the Vedas are all dialogues. The Agama and Nigama scriptures, these are the Tantric scriptures, are also often dialogues between Shiva and Parvati. Here, this scripture is a dialogue between Sri Tattatraya, who is the teacher of teachers, and Sri Parshurama, who is a great seeker and great warrior. Any questions or thoughts so far? Radhika Ji? Mm -hmm. Yes, Manisha? In this paragraph about the mention of nothing being destroyed, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so, I then does it does it also suggest there that nothing is created? I know it says that something is manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, Can you comment on this with regard to how we often think of? you know, um, creation, protection, destruction, like this sort of cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, the word creation, which we use in English, has a very different meaning. It implies that something is created out of nothing, very often. So, also coming from a more modern background, a lot of people are influenced by the concept of, Christian concept of 
God creating the world. And in Indian scriptures, we actually do not use the word creation. We say manifestation. So something is hidden and comes forward. So here, we, when we talk about the vehicle manufactured by desires, it is in fact these desires are already existing in us. And this is hidden. And when one is born, with birth, those desires that need to be manifested will come forward. So the body you acquire will be is related to the desires that you have. And that is a manifestation. So all the world around us is also a manifestation because we have created this world based on our desires, our samskaras. Samskaras is just another word for desires. And so we do not even use the word creation really. We use the word manifestation. We have often seen the, the diagram that we, we always use and we talk about uh, these, these things. And we can have a look at it again if you want to understand this, this concept once again. And that's this diagram where we talk about the senses and the body, they are all in this external world, which has been manifested. And where was it manifested from? We have intermediately here in transition period or a transition is the breath and the conscious mind, which is subtler. But far subtler is that part that is hidden, that is the active and latent unconscious mind. And when these desires get active, it comes forward in the conscious mind, in the body, and finally out in the external world. So anything that you see around you was a thought or a desire before it became reality. So some of you are sitting with your mobiles, some of you are sitting at your laptop. All these things were ideas before they became reality. So somewhere, somebody manifested this wonderful idea of having mobiles and laptops and many minds maybe um, came together before this became reality. And one day you thought, I should go buy myself a mobile or a laptop and it manifested there in your life. So we do not talk about creation, we talk about manifestation. Okay, thank you. I guess, yeah, in a way, it's being revealed. So we're, yes. we're, we're watching and we're actually maybe even not so much manifesting, but we're watching the manifestation. <clears throat> well, I would say... Um, or it's being revealed or it's being revealed. To yes, us. yes, it's being revealed. Uh, mostly we are not watching the manifestation because we're getting attached and involved into it and we're beginning to think that this is the reality. But in fact, all of it is a wonderful illusion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, that's kind of cute. Okay. So. so, in this last paragraph, we talked about the fact that this world is duality and the absolute one without second is Advaita, is non dualism. And there's one cannot really discuss this because discussions happen only in the state of duality. We are in this state of duality right now, and so we are having a discussion. We are talking, but that's not possible in a non-dual situation because there is no other. There's only one. So, the last paragraph, very briefly, we will go through it. 
It's about this translation that we are going to use. Pandit Tigunath, being a scholar of Sanskrit, translated the Tripura Rahasya in a manner that was very terse and scholarly. Therefore, it was not accessible to modern students, especially those in the West. After a careful reading of the translation, Deborah Wilby and I, that is Swami Rama, recommended that he modify it so that it would be accessible to the general reading public, especially those on the path of sadhana. Although this meant that he had to retranslate the entire scripture, I advised him to do so because a scholarly abstruse translation would be of no use to the general reader. The Tripura Rahasya is one of the most wonderful, practical of all scriptures. It's very helpful to those on the path of self-realization. I am certain that those aspirants who study this scripture in its present translation with full faith and a tranquil mind will have a new vision and will become aware of a completely new dimension of life. This paragraph here suggests that in fact Pandit Rajamani Tigunath did not really translate it. He, he made a translation which was too academic and as I have understood from different sources that Swami Rama played a very important role in the reworking of the translation and uh, we see during the translation itself when you read those who know his style will see the signs. Those who know how Panditji writes will, will notice that this is not really written uh, by him or was written by him and then excessively reworked by Swamiji. Okay, so... Balaji has a question right up front. If one desires to be a star in the galaxy, will the Jeeva Atman manifest as a star? Um, well, this is an unusual uh, desire. The, the stars are, have a different consciousness. I mean, they are inanimate. And uh, if you have a person who is, um, has a different level of consciousness, to, to go from being a human to being inanimate is the reverse. But there have been stories in mythology of beings, celestial beings, that were cursed by sages and turned into stone. So that's a curse. If you are wishing to be a star, an inanimate object, it's like a stone, right? Only it is maybe active and gaseous and, and um, um, erupts, <laughs> explosive. But that would be uh, not evolution, but it would be a fall. So that would... Yes, that can only happen if um, you do something really, really black karma. So now we start with the text itself. <laughs> it's a question from Shibu. From human, uh, it will not go anything smaller. And we, but uh, the question is not clear. But I assume you're you're saying that from human, you you don't go back to other forms like animals, plants. That would be reverse. Yes, you have evolved <laughs> many millions of lifetimes. It has taken you to get a human body. It's considered to be the great privilege to have a human body. It's the highest level of consciousness that we know of and um, if anybody says they want to be a I don't know a dog or a cat or something um, that that would be a sign of 
great ignorance according to the scriptures. And if you really wish that, desire it very strongly, it can also happen. There is the legend of a rishi, a sage, who in the jungle he had his little ashram and he found a, a, a fawn, a baby deer, a fawn, and it was motherless. The mother had been killed by the hunter and so the sage takes in the baby fawn and takes care of it, feeds it and takes care of it and in the process got very attached to it. And so when he gets attached to it and he's dying, he's very, very concerned about the, the fawn, the deer, and uh, his mind is only fixed on the deer. And because of that, he is reborn as a deer. Now, that is a fall from, from consciousness. However, the nice part of the story is that because of his good karma as a sage, he was born as a deer that lived near an ashram where there was another sage. And listening to the, to the uh, readings or the scriptures from the sage who was teaching his students, he acquired a desire to be human again. And so in the next life, he was a sage once again. So these mythologies, these stories actually are teachings all the stories that we know of, they do contain some teachings. They're not just nice stories. These mythological stories have a meaning. And so we understand that yes, it is possible to, to fall into a lower birth as an animal or to be cursed and <laughs> to be a stone means you also have fallen. It must be a terrible uh, action that led to, to one becoming a stone. So these stories indicate this is possible, but one should be very careful what one wishes. Because when the desire is very strong, it can happen. So the very first chapter is the quest of Parshurama and the grace of Gurudev Dattatreya. The very first verse, as is the tradition in all Indian scriptures, the very first verse or generally the very first chapter summarizes the entire book or the teachings. In this case, it is the very first verse, 1.1. Homage to the absolute reality, the source and the embodiment of bliss, Supreme Consciousness, here termed as she, the Mother, who is both the magnificent image of the universe and the mirror in which this dazzling reflection appears. So this first verse is the summary of the entire scripture, the teachings in a nutshell. So the absolute reality, the source of everything, consciousness, the Mother, all different words for the same for the same consciousness she is both the universe and the mirror in which this appears to reflect so all this is just mother all this is just consciousness all this is absolute reality everything is consciousness this is a very profound statement because when you come from a yogic perspective you are trained to think in terms of Shiva and Shakti or Atman and Brahman and so the training makes you think oh the world is different from consciousness but Tantra is the highest learning or insight tells us that ultimately everything is consciousness. In practice, however, we need to first accept that there is something in us that is 
very subtle, the subtle most. And that is different from the body, which is gross. That when we begin through practice, attain that subtle most consciousness, then we have this wonderful insight and say, oh my, actually everything is consciousness. Even the body is consciousness. The entire universe is consciousness. Okay, so we continue to verse 2. The sage Haritiana asked, O Narada, have you listened carefully to the canto extolling the glory of the absolute reality known as Tripura? Just listening to it is one of the most definite means of achieving liberation. I will now tell you the wondrous Jnana Kanda of the Tripura Rahasya. After listening to it attentively, a sadhaka is no longer subject to grief. This philosophy was developed after studying the Vedas, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism and Pashupata. There is no other philosophy that can be comprehended by the intellect as easily as this which Dattatreya taught to Parshurama. The teaching imparted here is based on logic and reasoning. If after receiving this knowledge, a person still does not comprehend it, he is indeed unfortunate. I now shall narrate the knowledge expressed in this canto of the Tripura Rahasya. So the author of this scripture is the sage Haratyana and he is talking to Narad, a sage, Please excuse me. Sorry about that interruption. So Haratiana asks Narad, have you heard about Tripura? And the Tripura Rahasya, this wonderful scripture, is from that section on knowledge. There are many scriptures and the scriptures have very often two sections. One is based on knowledge and the other is action or rituals. This scripture is of course in the section of knowledge. And he says this is such a wonderful scripture and if you don't understand this then you're really unfortunate. And it is been developed after having read and understood all the other scriptures. So he mentions the Vedas, the texts from the Shiva tradition, the texts from the other Shakta traditions, the texts from the Vaishnava tradition, that is of Vishnu. So this is a text about Tripura Rahasya. It's not about the goddess, it's not about religion. Tripura is the three cities. Rahasya is mystery or secret. So this is the mystery of the three cities. The three cities, what are these? We just saw it in the diagram. We just saw that and that was... To just look at it again briefly. We can see the three cities here now. This is the first city, here, this part. The waking state. This includes body and conscious mind. And of course it includes the world outside. This here, the active unconscious mind, is the second. And the latent unconscious is the third. So these are the three cities. Right. And the one who lives in the three cities is the center of consciousness.
Any questions so far about this? Okay, in that case we continue. The behavior of the enlightened ones is beyond the comprehension of ordinary people. That is the reason why a sage like you delights in these stories filled with wisdom. As the musk deer em emanates its fragrance, similarly such enlightened sages influence the life of many, particularly those who are on the path. Parshurama heard the Mahatmya Khanda from the mouth of Dattatreya. The Mahatma, the Mahatmya Khanda, Mahatmya is the greatness of the mother. So this is a scripture related to Shakti, to the great mother, and it's the speaking is spoken from the mouth of Dattatreya. These are the teachings by, of him. And he's the one who is narrating mostly the scripture in the form of stories. And um, questions are asked by Purshurama. And so it is said that just as the musk deer emanates his perfume or fragrance, enlightened sages influence the life of many who are on the path. And they cannot be understood by ordinary people because they have purified their minds. The minds have, you saw from the diagram, active and latent unconscious, where the samskaras are stored, and these have been purified, which means that these samskaras are no longer active. We cannot relate to such people because... Most of the time, all our various samskaras are so active that we do not have that kind of awareness to, to see it and we get involved in situations. For example, if you're angry, you get so involved in that because you feel attacked that you do not have the distance or the awareness to see why you're getting angry. Someone who has purified his mind, on the other hand, for example, with anger, he has dealt not only with anger about different things, but anger itself. This samskara has now been burnt away. So anger does not exist anymore. It's not active, at least. It cannot germinate. And so if you go to such a sage or such a person with a purified mind and insult him, he has nothing to say. He doesn't feel anger. It's not the same as pretending not to be angry. It's just that you don't have it. It's not there. There is simply no handle. And such people are therefore not understood because any normal person would get angry when you're insulted. But someone who is purified to that extent does not. Parshurama's heart was purified, overwhelmed by divinity, utterly calm and tranquil. His attention became one-pointed and inward for a while. He then regained normal awareness. Tears flowed from his eyes and his whole body vibrated for his heart was overflowing with spiritual bliss. His heart was not able to contain that overwhelming bliss. With all humility, he prostrated at his guru's lotus feet. When Parshurama gained awareness, he spontaneously uttered, O Gurudev, through your grace I am blessed, I am blessed. You, the ocean of compassion, Shiva himself, have blessed me, your blessings are incomparable. When the Guru Dev is pleased, there is no difference between mortality and immortality. I consider that I have received the mystery and attained the essential knowledge of the Mother Divine, Tripura, by your grace. 
O Lord, from you I have known the mysterious knowledge of Mother Divine and received her grace. I want to dedicate myself to the Mother of the Universe. Please show me the way of devotion. Dattatreya observed that Parshurama was fully prepared and endowed with firm faith and devotion, so he initiated him step by step into the worship of Tripura. One auspicious day, Parshurama received the initiation of Tripura, that which leads to the highest. As a honeybee collects nectar from various flowers, Parshurama gathered from his master all the means and methods of sadhana. Overwhelmed with joy, he received permission from his master to return to the mountains to perfect the science of Tripura. He circumambulated his master with reverence, took his leave and went to a, the mountain called Mahindra. There he built a beautiful and comfortable shelter and engaged with Sarna for 12 years. 12 years! <laughs> While following his daily sadhana, he devoted himself to worship, mantra, japa, meditation on the goddess Tripura with a one-pointed mind. So this is the very first part where we become, the, the text starts with the scene of master and disciple where he has already received the knowledge and the mystery. He goes after initiation, to, a, to, to solitude, to a quiet place, meditates for 12 years. What is happening these days, however, is that students come, they want to get initiation into Tantra, into Sri Vidya, and they have no time for meditation, or they don't really want to meditate, they just want to collect one more mantra, and they don't do anything. And then they say, oh, I'm practicing Tantra, I'm, I'm, I've got initiation of Tripura or of Srividya, but nothing is happening. How can anything happen? Because there's no practice, there's no sadhana. So you see, this text is very clear. It doesn't try to please you or in any way and try to tell you something to console you. Oh, you can do it in one year or, you know, in six months. It's very clear. Parshurama, who is a very great warrior, a symbol of having a one-pointed mind, he needs 12 years. And now let's see what happens after 12 years. Twelve years passed as if in a moment. One day... While sitting cheerfully, Parshurama began thinking. Long ago, while the sage Samvarta and I were walking together, Samvarta answered my question about the glory of Tripura. At that time, I didn't understand the significance of his words. I completely forgot what he said, so I could not confirm it by asking my Gurudev. I requested my master Dattatreya to reveal to me the mystery of the universe the true nature of the goddess Tripura. He considered my question irrelevant and ignored it. So my question remains unanswered. I do not know the secret of the universe. From where did this vast universe appear? How did it exist? Where will it rest after its final dissolution? Everything seems to be unstable. How can a relationship with any impermanent object last? All worldly activities seem confusing and mysterious. The behavior of the ignorant is like the blind following the blind. My own life is an example of this. I do not remember what happened in my childhood at all. I was a different person as an adolescent, still another person in my youth, and now my behavior is completely different. What is the result of all those changes? What the result of all those changes is, I do not know. Nor do I understand the cause of the relationship underlying changes. Nor do I remember what happened, what, at, at what time and by what means. Has anyone ever received what he really wanted from his so-called right actions? Has anyone ever attained happiness from action? Did anyone ever 
become happy? Whatever a person thinks he wants is not his desired object at all. Because after attaining it, he suddenly wants something different. If one has attained the fruits, then why does he desire the fruits again? I see that everyone is doing his duty for the purpose of obtaining fruits. The fruits can neither give freedom from sorrow nor bestow happiness. As long as karma still remains to be performed, there cannot be freedom from sorrow nor can there be happiness. Just as it is in vain to treat someone dying of thirst by rubbing cold sandalwood paste on his feet, it is equally senseless to try to gain happiness by running after worldly pleasures. Therefore, one whose duty remains to be accomplished can never be happy. If a man's chest is badly injured by arrows, he will not enjoy the embrace of celestial damsels. How can one whose worldly duty is not over expect to gain happiness? How can the best of music and song bring cheer to one who is in agony from an incurable disease? In reality, those who are free from the burden of their karmas are happy in the world. They are joyous sages. They are tranquil within and without. If one is burdened by karmas, how is it possible for him to be happy? If one is going to be hanged to death and is honoured by beautiful lie of sandalwood, will, it be, will he be comforted? Oh, it is astonishing that a person who is caught in the snare of worldly obligations actually believes that this trap is the prelude to happiness and conscientiously carries out those duties. How can I honour people who consider themselves to be happy while burdened by innumerable obligations? Both an emperor and a beggar constantly search for peace and happiness. Their concepts of happiness are different. One is happy by acquiring a kingdom, the other by receiving a coin. Both consider themselves to be blessed. Dropping this idea, shall I go to my revered guru and request the solution to my problem? This is indeed an act of auspiciousness. The words of my guru will help me cross the ocean of delusion. Parshurama set out immediately from Mount Mahendra to see his guru. So what has happened here? This is a very interesting sort of internal dialogue that Parshurama is he's talking to himself. After 12 years of practice of sadhana, he says, I still don't know where this universe appeared from. I don't know the secret. And he was different as a child and he was different as an adolescent. But he doesn't know and doesn't understand the cause of relationship between these changes. That means he doesn't know the foundation. He doesn't know the true self, the self within. So now you can imagine that after 12 years of practice, he still doesn't know the secret. And when we talk about knowing the secret, we're not talking about intellectually knowing it or reading it, but having the direct experience of it. So all those who are in a hurry to get self-realization or be free from suffering should be aware that they need to have some patience and put in lots of effort. This internal dialogue where he talks to himself, he asks the kind of questions that all sincere seekers ask. And this text is an answer to these questions. It is very well portrayed here and says that most people in the world, they are seeking their happiness in material objects and in, in the world. And that is like trying to cure somebody or treat somebody who's dying of thirst by putting sandalwood paste on his feet. Or it's like a man who's 
chest is really wounded, how can he possibly enjoy the embrace of celestial damsels? You can't. But that's exactly what most people think when they are trying to seek happiness in all the worldly pleasures. If you have terrible disease, how can you enjoy the best of music? You're, or, you know, you're, you're just feeling sick. You can't enjoy it. And if you're condemned to be hanged to death, how can you enjoy any honors that are bestowed on you by someone else? So you see the futility of this is described in all these situations. The futility of seeking happiness in transitory pleasures and objects. And so he compares an emperor or a beggar. It doesn't matter. They all are searching for happiness. We have, may have different levels of happiness. The emperor is happy when he has a kingdom and the beggar is happy just with the coin. So having contemplated on this, he decided that he needed to have some answers. And he set off immediately to see his guru, his Gurudev Dattatreya. Soon he arrived at Mount Gandhamadana, and there he saw his master seated in the lotus posture like a self illuminated sun. He prostrated in front of his master's wooden sandals, then holding the sandals on his palm. He reverentially placed his head on them. Accepting Parshurama's reverential greetings with appreciation, Dattatreya lifted him with compassion and blessings and embraced him. For some of you who don't have an Indian background, this form of greeting the master was practiced earlier but has sort of fallen out of um, fashion and uh, it's uh, not done anymore but that was a traditional greeting and showed great humility and great respect for a teacher. Dattatraya asked Son, I am seeing you after a long time. How are you? Are you healthy? He received thus Parshurama sat down on the cushion and after saluting his Gurudev reverentially, began to speak. O Gurudev, ocean of compassion, how can one who has received your grace suffer from misery? I am fully protected by the shield of your grace. Then how can this cruel misery come near me? I feel your grace within and without. Separation from you is the only pain I have. And now, after being in your presence, that has disappeared. But something has lingered in my heart for a long time. Because of that, my mind is full of doubt. With your permission, may I ask you to resolve this. Hearing this, the compassionate Dattaratya joyfully said, Parshurama, ask whatever questions you have. Delighted with your devotion, I will answer them happily. In this way, the dialogue between the sages, Dattatreya and Parshurama, ends in perfect harmony. This is called Janakhanda. So this ends the chap first chapter where, in fact, the real scripture just begins now in chapter 2 because so far we had the situation where it opened with Parshurama having received guidance, going to Mount Mahendra, practicing for 12 years, but finding still that he had not attained, he had still got questions and he comes back to his master after 12 years and begins the discussion again. It is very important to understand that having practiced, when you ask questions after long, deep practice, the questions will be of a completely different nature. If you haven't practiced, you're in the world, you have suffered, you have gone through a lot of turmoil in the world, you have questions, but 
they are of a different nature. But once you have practiced, you have deepened your knowledge and you come back to the teacher, the quality of your questions will be different because now the questions will be based on practice. They will not be based merely on intellectual understanding or reading or philosophy, but they will be based on your own experience of conscious mind, active unconscious and latent unconscious. We will ask a completely different kind of question. Any questions so far to the introduction or to this first chapter or in general? Because I do not want to start chapter 2 now at this point since we are almost going to end. So if there are any questions or there are any comments. Okay. If everybody is very happy and there are no questions, then we can end this session here. And next Saturday we continue with chapter 2 where in fact the real scripture starts. Bye bye everybody and have a nice weekend.